What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to My Social Life. This is the podcast where you can hear the real stories behind the people on social media. I'm your host, Jacob Kelly. And as always, today's podcast is powered by TrueFan. And before we get into today's conversation with Greg Rowe, there's a couple things that we need to go over first. Number one, if you enjoyed today's podcast, please consider leaving a rating and a review. The more positive ratings and reviews we get, the more it helps new people find the show. And it really helps to grow the community that we're developing here. And if you're one of those people that have recently found the podcast, Welcome. I'm very excited to have you here. Make sure you subscribe and stay tuned for future episodes. And to everybody listening, make sure you screenshot this, post it to your Instagram story, tag myself at the Jacob Kelly and Greg at, at Greg Rowe Trampoline. And I'll feature you on my account and send you a message as well. And now, without further ado, let's get to my conversation with Greg Rowe. What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to My Social Life. This is the podcast where you can hear the real stories behind the people on social media. I'm your host, Jacob Kelly. As always, today's podcast is powered by TrueFan. And today we're joined by Greg Rowe. And Greg is described as the world's first extreme trampolinist. A former member of Team Canada, Greg decided the traditional route of a professional trampoliner wasn't for him. So he stuck it on his own to forge his own path and create his own market. Since then, he has been featured on America's Got Talent, Nitro Circus, Daily Planet, The New York Times, and more. Today, he is the co-founder of the Freestyle Trampoline Association and owner of Greg Rowe Trampoline. And I'm very excited to have him here on the podcast today. Greg, welcome to the podcast. Hey, good, man. Thanks for having me. I'm excited. My pleasure. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. And where I want to start today, I want to go all the way back, all the way back to the beginning. So it's very public out there that you were, you grew up in Canada, but you were adopted from Russia when you were five, right? Yeah. Yeah. Moscow. And Moscow. So I'm just curious, is it, like, what is kind of a two-pronged question to start here? What was life like in the orphanage growing up? Like, do you remember what it was like growing up in Russia for those first five years? And how, what was the transition like moving to Canada at five years old? I can't imagine what that must have been like. Um, okay, so the first part of your question, um, the orphanage is just like what you would expect in a Russian, Romanian, Eastern Bloc country orphanage just when the Iron Curtain was falling. Um, I think they actually did better for us than a lot of orphanages, but there was still that strict sort of, you know, we had regular beating times. We'd all sit around and they all like hit us individually and it was like a lineup kind of thing. And they would have like, uh, it would be a contest for food and stuff like that. Like I remember one time the doors are all closed and I can't remember exactly how it worked out, but basically it's, you open the doors and then everyone just runs in and grabs whatever food they can because they don't have much, right? Because it's all that whole communism stuff. They're still struggling with all that. So it was it wasn't a good economic state. And then when I got to Canada, obviously, I was adopted to a really nice middle uh, class family. And they obviously gave me the platform that I really needed. But the thing is, a lot of people don't understand is that those first five years in the orphanage really do shape the way you look at the world a lot more than people realize. A psychologist knows this for sure. And anyone who gets into the biology and stuff like that. But it's those memories are what fuel me to then do what I have to do, whatever that becomes along my journey. So I, I actually enjoy the orphanage. A lot of people look at it like, oh, you know, when, not so much now, but when I was younger, like, oh, he's an orphan. Oh, no. And they, they, they get the sob story. I'm like, dude, that's great. I got a second chance at life. I got a great family that gave me basically all the tools I needed to do something. Um, and I have even better than all that is I have a demon that I'm running from that motivates me every day. So I don't see the really the bad problem with that, um, even though it's harsh and some of the memories kind of suck and it's like, yeah, it's too bad, but you need that to move forward. So uh, I wouldn't actually take it back at all. Mm -hmm. And then, so when, when you moved here, ultimately, like, why did you end up enrolling in gymnastics for the first time? I believe you were eight when you first enrolled. No, I was much earlier that I, I didn't start officially competing until I was about eight years old. But um, a lot of people will start when they're like five, six. So I, I wasn't even speaking English when I came. I was just pointing at the TV. Some guy was doing rings or some high bar thing. I don't even remember it, you know, and because I, I literally was fluent Russian at this time. There's videos of me just going blah, blah, blah in Russian, pointing. And parents said, oh, I guess he likes gymnastics. OK, let's put him in there. And I was a rambunctious kid. You know, once you kind of let me out of the cage of Russia, then all of a sudden I'm go, go, go go 100 miles an hour. I'm not sure where I was going, but so they basically filled me up with lots of activities and said, okay, well, he's going to do hockey. He's going to do soccer. He's going to do basketball. He's going to do extracurricular he's do music classes, gymnastics. And I was doing all of that sort of stuff as I was transitioning and learning what I guess normal people life is, or at least the Western side, you know, cause we've gone to Honduras and started charities there. We've gone to Indonesia and stuff. So like, um, when I got to the Western side of the world, it was, um, it wasn't a reality check because I didn't have 
anything to base on. For me, just, oh, life got a little bit better. Great. Sweet. I can do this stuff now. I never, like, you don't get traumatized by that. And I don't know if I'm different or if that's just normal and everyone just thinks that people that come from an orphanage have to be traumatized, but I don't think so. You know, so I basically transitioned nicely. After a couple of years, I would speak uh, fluent English, forgot all my Russian. I haven't spoke Russian forever. And um, I started my gymnastics career. And I was, you know, you start off by just doing a couple hours a week. Um, and I got kicked out of my very first gym because from the Olympic coach himself, actually, which is really funny when I was like six. And because um, I wouldn't stand in line for vault. And from there, I, my parents found another gym that was a lot more inclusive, let's say, and understood my background and that rambunctious attitude and baggage I was kind of coming with. Right. So then uh, basically the coach is very smart. What he did is he put me into the big boy group where normally you'd have different ages. Right. And, you know, the six to eight year olds go together, the nine to 12 year olds and then, you know, so on and so forth. He put me right in with the 18 year olds and I was only six, seven, eight at the time. And uh, basically they whipped me into shape. I picked fights. They beat me down. I picked more fights. They beat me down again. And eventually I kind of got tempered. And that's how I was legitimately socialized through gymnastics in that sort of way. Not not even really through society because I was around parents that were a little bit more, let's say, sensitive to my background. So they they kind of were always there to help me almost sometimes too much. Right. But gymnastics is like, well, uh, if you screw up, that's your problem. I can't save you from the judges. I can't save you from getting hurt. It's up to you at the end of the day when you're going at the vault or you're doing whatever it is. So that was the really good balance that my coach gave me that my parents were too biased to be able to do, which and any parent would have made that I would have done that behavior so I there's no blame there but it gave me that balance that I really needed to here's what reality is and people aren't going to cry for you because you're an orphan but the other side I had that support structure at home that I needed to balance both sides Mm -hmm. and I've heard you say I have have a a quote written down here for me he says gymnastics literally saved your life why why is that what did gymnastics do that saved your life in your mind Well, as I got older, and again, back to the psychology thing, you know, the first five years of your life that that doesn't go away, you know, those those neural uh, networks don't don't change too much. And um, by the time I was 12, 13, 14, I was becoming a teenager, the cortisol levels are going through the hormones are doing this, that and the other. And I'm getting into let's say nothing too major. But of course, when you're growing up in a probably the roughest school on the east side, or the west side, sorry, of Toronto, you're going to get mixed up with all that. So I did. And uh, I got in trouble, uh, quite a bit of trouble, actually, several times. Um, but because of the fact that when everything, you know, hit the fan, uh, I could basically go to my gymnastics and say that that I can do that instead. So I don't have to go to that life. Because if I didn't have the training to do for five hours a day, God knows what I would have been doing instead. Even the little bits of the bad stuff I used to do was enough to uh, get me into some deep poo-poo. And, um, and by being in gymnastics, it, it helped me break away. It's like it gave me an alternative that a lot of my friends really just didn't have. Mm-hmm. And then ultimately you made it to an extremely high level with gymnastics. You won a gold medal on the parallel bars at Canadian nationals in 2007. What did it mean to you to be named national champion? Um, <laughs> I don't know, you know, you, that's a tough question because you want it but when you get it. It's kind of like a more of a relief than it is a, oh my God, yeah, you know, it's, it's more of a relief because I go, oh, thank God, oh, okay, I didn't screw this up. Yeah, and, and it's, almost, it's almost secondary that you actually won. But for me, I was really happy because there was, uh, I had an idol at the time, not a full idol, but one of my idols um, was a guy named Kyle Schufeld. He was a Canadian uh, and he went to 2004 Olympics, if I have that correct. And um, he got a medal on vault or floor, I can't remember exactly, but he, I always looked up to him. And uh, he was the one that actually then gave me my medal. And he had no idea who I was, um, even though we met again years later. He doesn't know that was me, but that was really cool for me just to be able to shake the hand with my idol. And I I remember that as part of, and when we get to the whole social media stuff, it does play a factor, something simple like that. Mm -hmm. And I just want to go back on kind of that feeling of relief more so than accomplishment for winning the gold medal. When you're setting goals or when you're accomplishing things today, is that still something that sticks with you where it's never like a feeling of accomplishment, but relief when you do it, when you do achieve a goal or has that changed now that you're not competing anymore? Um, 
again, going back to the psychology. So I do a lot of psychology because I'm a coach. So I have to know how the brain works so that the athletes don't start doing some weird stuff. And one thing I've learned and witnessed with myself and just experienced through just through my 25 years um, is that, you know, the motivation's there before you get to the end. Once you get to the end, if you're a motivated type of individual and that wasn't like your be all and end all goal of your entire life, like if it's marriage or having babies or something, that's a little bit different. But for me, it was that was one instant in time. And I knew that I was going to go back to the gym the next day to train for the next competition. So it evaporates almost instantly. And, um, and that's a bit of a sad part because a lot of coaches for, forget that part. Um, and for them, it lives a little bit longer just the way the, the brain gets older. But when you're a younger age, it's easy to forget and always go to the next one. So as, as I now have my own businesses and stuff, it's the, it's the same. Like I'll, I'll, uh, like we're working on signing a big Japan tour with our team right now. And I've already moved on. As far as I can tell, the, the contract's basically signed, but we haven't actually planned it out. But for me, in my head, it's already done. And I'm now working on a TV show with some other guys. And that's where I'm getting my motivation. So it's always next, 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 next. And yes, you're never happy in some regard. But then what happens is as I feel that I'm getting there, I feel euphoric all the time. It's not like I have to wait till the medal's placed on my head for me to be like, yo, yes, now I understand I did. I, I knew. Well, I know from training before I even get to the competition, if I'm expecting to do well and I'm motivated there. So I feel that duration, but then within an instant, it's gone. And then, I'm, okay, what's the next one? But then I ride that wave again to that next sort of, uh, you know, wave going into the beach. And then there's always a new wave. So you're riding the wave as long as you can, but it does end and you have to jump to a new one as quick as possible. Mm -hmm. And speaking of like, it's things ending and just looking for that next thing. So you were a national champion in 20 or 2007. And then a year later, 2008, correct me if I'm wrong on the year, but I believe it was a year later where you were deciding to move away from gymnastics and into trampoline. So what led to that decision? Yeah. Um, I was basically just getting bored gymnastics. Once you get to that level, it's just repetition, 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 10 routines on six events every day for four months before your first competition. Uh, I don't know about you, but that gets boring real fast, you know, so it's, it's a kind of an undiscussed thing that a lot of gymnasts basically, they work their butts off for, you know, six months during competition season, but they're really itching just to get to summer training where they can just try all the new stuff. So, um, for me, when I look at break up a year into, let's say quarters, 75% of my year is just doing the same old routines, only the summer three months or so. Do I get to actually play? Because you're not done. Uh, you, you st you're starting competing, you know, in uh, worlds and all that stuff is in November, right? But then you're already competing and doing stuff in uh, like January for the lower level. So depending on what level and what competition you're going, you are competing all year round. So if you can find yourself a couple months off without anything, that's that's rare. So for me, it just didn't make sense financially, not really financially, sorry. Like from a fraction perspective, I'm only joined 25% of my training, which is in the summer. That's when I get to play and have fun and try new things because that's my thing, right? I want new stuff. I don't like the old boring, I've done it already, then I, I need something new. So once I just did that calculation just in my head, then I was like, okay, well, I'll try trampoline. That's new. So I tried that, but I had, a, and I had the Olympic coach um, up at the, about an hour away from me at the time. I used to train with him a little bit as like cross training for gymnastics, dismounts and stuff like that. So I already kind of knew the club. I already knew the coach. They already knew me. So they said, hey, why don't you just come to tryouts? I'm like, oh, okay, I'll just come and hang out and bounce around. Uh, they put me on the team right away just because I had already had everything. Um, and then after a couple of years, I was on Team Canada because I think not I, like I have a hard work ethic, but it was also because I had a uh, gymnastics background. Like we were strong handstand pushups all the time, dips, muscle up, cross, multis, all these strength things that you see. So when I had to just adapt it to trampoline, it was actually relatively easy. I just need to fine tune the technique a little bit and find my footing, excuse the trampoline pun. And then uh, from there. It was actually pretty simple. I got onto team. I was top four for a couple of years. And that's when it all kind of, I started thinking even more. And that's when it all unraveled and I left. Yeah. So kind of to put into context for people before we kind of get into everything unraveling. At that time, 2010-ish, 2011, when you're on Team Canada, how do you make money as a, as an, as an, as an, as a Canadian level trampolinist? Trampoliner? What's the correct verbiage for that? 
a traditional trampolinist. Yeah. Trampolinist. Like trampolinist. how, like how, do, how are you making money then as a traditional trampolinist at that time? Just kind of put into context for people, the opportunity then versus the opportunities you're facing now. Yeah. Well, there was no opportunities then. Um, when you're top four, you're basically paying your own way. So you're paying roughly three to $5,000 a year, just in training fees, uh, depending on where you go and how many hours you're doing and all that. You're paying all your way to go to nationals. You have three meets, uh, one of the East, West, and Central Coast. Uh, those qualify you for the World Cup team and all that sort of stuff. But you're paying your way for all of that. That's three flights there and back. Family's going with you. It's When I added it up, it's about a quarter of a million dollars um, that is invested roughly, very roughly. Uh, I did it for a university project. And um, yeah, that was it was about a quarter of a million dollars of say you have about a 15-year-long career, which is what people kind of see. Uh, it takes you about 15 years to get up to that level, and that's what you're expected to pay. Once you come top two all the time, which I wasn't there long enough to be able to do that, uh, then they'll give you uh, the, full, the top guy will get full funding uh, and girl, and the second one will get partial, third will get partial, fourth will basically get nothing besides maybe a, a grant here or there. Um, it's very sparse, and this is partly why I left. I was like, there just isn't, there wasn't enough athlete centered approaches to trying to get them to make a career. Because you got to remember, these guys, you're, I'm going to university at the time. So I'm doing my 40 hours a week there at university. I'm also working two part time jobs at a gym driving from my university to those different gyms on the way to training at like nine o'clock at night for a couple hours, driving an hour back and then doing my university stuff until one or two in the morning, making sure I don't fail class. And I'm up at eight Oh five. Don't ask me why they made that the starting time for the class. You know, I'm up at eight Oh five again. And then it happens again. And you do that for four years, but I had been doing that ever since I was six, right. With all my activities. So I'm used to it, but a lot of people don't realize that. Yeah. It's, it's a full-time job forever. Um, until you retire and there really isn't any finances like if you go to the olympics now i don't know if my numbers are correct here with inflation and just different policies and stuff but back in my day about 10 years ago you only got if you won the olympics if you win the entire thing you do the best in the world that anyone could ever do for at the biggest competition that anyone could ever go to the best you get in canada was like fifty thousand dollars and um i think that's actually a high estimate compared to what i remember but yeah, it's nothing. It's the one fifth of the investment that your entire family has to put into it. And that's just for one kid. Never mind the other kids that want to do their own activities that mom and dad can't do. Right. So uh, when you factor in all of that, you realize, oh my God, the, and the best chance I have is getting 50 grand back out of all that. You know, and so financially, it made no sense. I knew there was no career. Um, you get a bit of funding. Uh, they give you, like, I think it's like 2,500 bucks a month, which um, is a very you know, meager living, it gets you by, but you know, you got to, I looked at it like, well, Hey, hold on. I'm here. And the reason you're getting thousands and like, so the Federation for most federations, I won't name specific ones, but as I travel, I've kind of talked to all the federations and they're, they're pocketing two to $3 million a year. And the athletes are pocketing basically not much. Um, you know, they're getting their expenses covered and maybe an extra 30 grand if you're the top one, but that's because trampoline gymnastics just isn't, it's not that type of sport. And, you know, I, I'm on the fence between the freestyle side, which is new, and the traditional side, which is, let's call it old or, you know, systematic. I don't know how you want to say that, but, you know, I'm in the middle of these two. And my big fight is saying, guys, you need to start delivering deliverables to your athletes much sooner, or you're not going to keep them. Just same reason I left and everyone else is following me to this whole new freestyle trampoline sector basically thinks the exact same thing. And I try to tell them that you know, in a much more positive way at the start. And they basically shut me down and said, the system is the system. There's no money for here. There's no opportunities. Too bad. Shut your mouth and don't ask questions. And I said, oh, okay. If that's the deal, bye-bye. I'm out. And then I, but they, they, they knew I was out for about a year. Then I was like, just kind of sloughing off training. I was missing stuff. I was throwing competitions just because I really didn't care to stick around in a whole nother day to go to finals the next day. You know, I really just didn't care. And everyone knew. Um, and I eventually got a letter from the, the head coach at the time. Um, and I think he's still the head coach. And uh, it basically said, uh, you know, you're, we, you're not part of our culture. You know, you don't share our values. So you're off the team. And I said, oh, okay, that's fine. And then at that time, though, because the whole year what I've been doing was basically knowing I'm like, okay, this, there's no hope here. There's no, there's no 
you know, if you're going to dangle a million dollars in front of me, yeah, you know, that's what you do with every other major, not every, but most major sports. That's why you get the numbers. That's it's simple game theory, biology, capitalism at the core of your brainstem that everyone has. So to try to ignore that and pretend like that shouldn't exist and you're somehow immoral because you want to be paid a value for the services and you're pulling in $3 million a year through people like me, then, well, where's my, where's my share? Oh yeah, you don't do that. You know, and I think the NCAA is going through a whole thing right now where they're now giving, you know, they're fighting for that. They're fighting for likeness and stuff like that on, um, on branding and sponsorship. Not sure exactly the details, but this, this is an age old fight ever since amateurism and, and pro stuff, you know, and that, uh, and categories, you know, that's, it's an age old sort of fight. So I was basically new to it and I realized, yeah, this, uh, this isn't, this isn't for me. There's no growth. Um, you could theoretically win the Olympics. Make your fifty thousand dollars back, still be in debt, go to university, get a nice job. Um, be they'll decorate you for a couple of years. You go own a gym, probably with a, an investor because you won the Olympics, so you can put your name on the building. Um, and then now you live in that building for the rest of your life, coaching kids. And I'm like, what? I don't want to do that. That that would be the best case scenario. And you write a book or two, you know. And but even still, no one. They didn't have the image. They, and I knew this. I, like, I, I'm like thinking YouTube's getting big, social media's getting big, and these guys out there being cool, Nitro Circus being an example. Well, then what are you guys doing? Are you sticking me in tights and parading me around, not giving me any money, and you expect the rest of the world to follow this? It doesn't even make any sense. Why would anyone do this? You know. And once it was kind of like that, then it was, the path was clear. And then it was just about setting up how to do it properly. And that's, that's the next leg of the journey. Mm-hmm. And kind of uh, before we move on to the next leg of the journey, I want to ask you about an important conversation you had in a Starbucks with Trish McGreer, where she kind of expl- like broke down how much money you can make with sponsorship and everything. Were you to decide to go out on your own? Can you kind of share some details of that conversation? Yeah, it's a Trish McGear, and she was basically my investor. She was the first one that believed in me and said, okay, you know, uh, we're going to leave this Team Canada thing. She used to do the uh, Team Subaru Rally. So she knows the freestyle world. She knows big sponsorships. She knows big budgets. She knows all that sort of stuff. And she knows how to get the stuff on TV, right? And at this time, gymnastics was, and trampoline was going off TV because their, their Nielsen ratings really just aren't that great unless it's around the Olympics. And, um, you know, it, that's a whole other discussion. But we, she basically sat me down and said basically kind of what I just told you is, where's the money? Where's your career? What are you going to do? Coach kids for the rest of your life? I'm like, well, no, you know, I like coaching and all, but... Uh, a guy like me, I'm a go, go, go kind of guy that can't stand in line for a vault, as we know, when I was six years old. So, you know, it's like, OK, we got it. You're going to have to do it yourself. You're going to be an entrepreneur kind of guy. I'm like, yep, 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 yep. Let's go. And she basically just started teaching me how to think from a business perspective, which um, Team Canada does, doesn't teach you. You know, a lot of school, any school doesn't teach you. And a lot of other federations we deal with that are outside of even the gymnastics acrobatic world are also guilty of you know not giving the proper tools to these athletes and they're under a lot of scrutiny to start doing so but it's a a slow haul but basically what the conversation was what do you want to do with your life and then basically from there though it was i i want to start my own business and i basically want freestyle trampoline to be its own category uh we basically had seen some videos of people doing stuff and we're like yeah we can do that and this is when nitro circus and all these other things were kind of popping up so this is where we were starting to be able to then hang out with the people. Like I go down to Pastrana land and um, that was where Travis lives and he does all his videos out there. And we shot action figures three, the movie with all the guys and everything. And I got to be around that world, that more exciting world, you know, and I could wear whatever I wanted to wear, be however I wanted to be. You know, if I wanted to swear, I could swear. You know, at one time in a competition, I, I said the F word really loud when my synchro partner uh, and I got out of bounds because I messed up and took an extra bounce for no real reason. And, you know, all that stuff's really frowned upon, you know, and it just wasn't my culture. Um, it was, just wasn't for me. So they were right. Um, but I, where I kind of still, you know, raised my eyebrows at them and said, well, you, you know, I'm a dedicated guy to your sport. Um, you guys basically try to push me out. Imagine if you had actually partnered with me, you know, we've made a lot of headway in, in areas they just didn't even think to look. And that's, that's the only thing I can kind of say, kind of, all, bo- both sides could have handled the whole thing a lot smarter. Mm-hmm. And then I heard you say that once you ended up leaving Team Canada, 
you learned marketing by traveling around and sitting down with leaders in the industry and just learning from them and having conversations with them. Can you kind of say who some of those people were and some of the lessons that you learned from them? I can't say specifically who because uh, we're balancing between two industries um, and everyone knows each other. It's a small industry at the top, like any industry. So uh, I do have a, a responsibility not to open uh, Pandora's box, let's call it. But <laughs> but let's just say that it was it was just action sports people. Like I can say Travis, obviously, because we've done stuff with him and all his guys and the Nitro crew and everything. Like that was definitely a mind changing experience because you get to see behind the scenes how they run the shows, how they stack the the stadium. You know, one really interesting moment for me was when you know gymnastics is all about safety and you know safety is our number one priority, even though they have higher injury rates than majority of other sports. So I won't even dissect that whole rationale. But we basically did the whole Nitro Circus thing. And there's a guy named Bruce. He was their commentator. And a girl had gotten hurt at one of their events pretty badly. And uh, the UK government, when they did a UK show, apparently, basically was calling them out, you know, going through the tabloids and blah, blah, blah. They're unsafe and all that. And he's like, we don't care what the UK government thinks. Screw them, blah, blah, blah. And the way he got the entire stadium screaming, I've never heard it before. And that was, to me, was like, oh, man, there's another world. Because in gymnastics, you're taught there is no other world. You, that is your life. And, and if you ever say, I'm, like, I wasn't allowed to snowboard and stuff like that. You know, I did that against my coaches, right? When I March break or whatever holidays, right? Oh, no, no, you can't do that because you might get hurt for competition might get hurt for competition. You might get hurt for competition. It's all about them. You know, they didn't think that athletes needed a balanced lifestyle and let them pick. It was all just about how you can give to their system, I guess, in some weird way. And uh, that was that was an eye opener. That one simple moment in that one show that really made me realize there's a whole other way to look at this acrobatic thing in a much more extreme, fun, energetic, engaging sort of way. And gymnastics and trampoline, you know, as a conglomerate sort of community, we'll call it, um, really just wasn't looking at it that way. Once I saw that, I and I, I basically did a two month of tours with them. Uh, freestyle trampoline was born in my mind, and then I just had to go make it. Mm -hmm. And I want to talk about in terms of social media, the video that like kind of really threw you into the social media and influencer world. And that was a video you did with Devin Supertramp back in 2014. You did, a, you did a trampoline video with him. How did that opportunity come up? Um, like most opportunities at the very start of your career, we paid our way to go there. You know, I wasn't paid. I was just a ringer. They basically said, hey, we, we lost a guy that wanted to do a trampoline thing. Because you'll notice that the two guys there on the video, um, they, they basically are part of another group. One of their guys opted out and they needed someone that was really good on trampoline. And I had already been releasing a bunch of my YouTube videos and stuff of that at training before I'd left the road or hit the road, sorry. And uh, they picked that up and said, oh, hey, you come, are you, but we can't pay, but it'd be a good opportunity. And I'm, I, I knew who Devin was at the time. And I was like, holy crap, an uh, opportunity to do a video with Devin? Yeah, I'm going to do it, right? So we basically packed up and took all the money of our piggy, piggy banks and, uh, tromped off onto Europe and it was, it changed that. Yeah. It changed my life ever since then. It's uh, just, you know, exploded. Mm -hmm. Talk to me about filming day. Like what goes into shooting one of his videos? Maybe it's multiple days, but he just has some, he's especially back in that point in time. Like he was massive on the platform, putting out videos that always pulled huge numbers. Like your video has that you did with him has millions of views. Like what was the, what did the shooting day look like with him? Well, it basically, I sat around for the whole day because um, they had to set up all the equipment. They were just doing all their glide cam stuff, making sure everything was good to go. And they, they actually shot like three different videos all in the same sort of week. So they had like a, a trampoline dunk video. They had a, um, a teeterboard video and then my trampoline video. So it was a big group of athletes all basically traveling together and kind of filming together, right? So I was like second up, I guess, after the teeterboard guys. And they had been filming for six hours and it was just go, go, go in the sun. And it was like, they never stopped. You know, it's a lot more work than people realize. So when it's finally my turn, the trampoline is set up and basically you're, you're performing. It's, it's no different than a competition. And 
uh, Devin says, okay, what are we going to do? And I basically throw him some ideas. Okay, well, we're going to do, uh, I don't know, this quad backflip here or this quad twist here. Like I'm thinking like, okay, I know enough about my sport and about enough about what the different tricks are to know what's going to be good on the camera. He knows how to shoot in and edit and all that sort of stuff. Um, I knew the different positions. So my job was to try to come up with unique stuff that it wasn't just the same triple backflip over and over and over again, you know? And um, then it was just basically pretty simple. Him and I coordinating uh, along with Parker. Parker at the time was uh, his right-hand man. He's now moved on to do his own educational stuff. But um, so they were just, we were just coordinating. We shoot and then they'd be, okay, three, two. And then I'm, I'm so I jump one, two, three. And I always count out loud because that tells them. Because if you look at Devin's videos, they're always like sweeping shots with the glide cams and stuff. So I would say one, two, three. And then they would know when to go. And then I just do my thing. So I don't even pay attention to the cameras. I just land the skill that I know I should be landing. And then, and once in a while, Devin come over and like, oh crap, I can't do it again. You know, and you see them in the behind the scenes video, they had a funny example of it, but that happened a whole bunch of times. And so, but you just get up. It wasn't like stressful. It was hot though. It was in the middle of, we were in Italy and it was the middle of the summer and it was just go, go, go because you, the permits only last so long and all that sort of stuff. So. It it was like a, a two hour competition where we just threw down the skills and one time the guys were bouncing me and I was doing some double bouncing stuff. So there's one part of the clip where I'm you just they're shooting up and you just see me doing funny positions in the air. So these guys were bouncing me off camera that you can't really see, and they almost died because they uh, double bounced me too high and almost landed in a spring and flew off onto the concrete. So that was kind of scary, but that happens with every kind of video. So um, you know, no issues there. And uh, once it was done, it was, again, a huge relief. It was, oh, and I didn't kill myself, and it got a lot of great shots, and then it was just waiting for it to come out to see, you know, what the results were going to be. And then so talk to me about when it when it finally did come out. Like, how, what was it, did it get traction right away? Like, it had millions of views today, but how did it do right when it came out? And, like, did opportunities start coming your way as a result of it? Like, how, how, what was just the reaction to that video? It was a mixed reaction because we had to wait like six months or something to actually release the thing. Um, and that's just like that for any major videos you're doing, whether it's TV or YouTube or anything. So we had already moved on to a bunch of other things and finally it was coming out. I was like, oh, okay. And I remember seeing it and then I, you know, it's like, oh, okay, here we go, here we go. So I watch it and I had a bunch of my buddies over anyway. So I'm like, oh, holy, check it out, check it out. Put it on the TV and everything. And the thing I remember wasn't even the video, it was the music. I love the music. That's the thing that, that I think really caught the audience. If I had to be analytical about why that one did well compared to some of his others that really haven't, I think it's the music. The music was a perfect, perfect, you know, fly, 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 you know, all that when it was perfect. So that's what I remember. Um, but then, you know, life goes back to normal. You check it for the first like week and you're kind of, you're commenting on everything and people are just like, Oh, and you're posting it and everyone's, you know, but, could people forget so fast and that's a lot of young kids don't understand that you got to do that like every week if you're going to be a youtuber you can't do that once in six months and then expect to have a platform it doesn't work that way right so it once we kind of saw it, it hit like i don't know half a million views after a week or so uh, or a couple weeks actually and then i forgot about it and moved on and that's just the way it works and then actually a couple years later i looked back and saw i was at like three million views i was like oh damn that did really well cool but I had raised so much other things on my plate that it almost didn't matter. You know, uh, it does matter. Like you need, you need to be able to have a reference point when you're talking to brands and stuff like that. But it didn't really matter because it, it, the brands are not looking for a, a flyby. They're looking for that consistency. So to be honest, uh, we haven't thought about it. I've worked with Devin a couple of times since then. Um, so that's good for consistency. But that video itself um, is just, just another one, you know? Mm-hmm. And when it came out at the time, they're like, I have a quote here that it kind of like launched you into like international, international attention almost and paved the way for you to become an influencer. Did you see a spike in following at that time? And like, I went back and I read the description. It's funny that I, I believe you only linked your Facebook page because Instagram wasn't as big as it was at the time when that video initially came out. But did you see kind of a big spike in following when that video came out? No, I really didn't because my audience was still the traditional gymnastics guys that were saying, you should be in a closed gym with a coach and blah, 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 and all this sort of stuff. They, that was the first time someone had really done a trampoline video like that outside, you know, around concrete. So it didn't really spark them. They just thought I was basically being a stuntman and just basically pimping myself out to social media, which they, they always thought that they were above that. They were all, we have a real sport, you know, dancing on social media doesn't actually pay the bills. 
Well, obviously that hen has come back to roost or chicken. I don't even know what the saying is, but you know, and, uh, but obviously, yeah, they're completely wrong about that one. And, uh, which we knew they were, and we knew back then that they were going to be wrong. Like we were making a prediction. Like that's when we hit the road, there was, we were predicting stock markets. We were saying, Hey, this stock is going to plummet. This one's going to rise. I'm going to put all my resources or at least a big chunk of them into this stock instead. So it's, it's no different than the way, a uh, a stock guy will look at it. And that's how we did it. And you mentioned too, that it was about six months after the the Devin Supertramp video that you filmed or that it actually came out and you had a bunch of other stuff on your plate at that time. And one of the things that I'm assuming you had, it, I might have the timeline a little bit mixed up here, but was trying to find a way to do the gravity jump, which for people that don't know is where you jump out of a crane into a big airbag. And I'm curious. So I know that you had this idea for a while and you ended up having to go over to Austria to get it done for the first time, right? Yeah, so that was that was with a company called Bag Jump, and they were legitimately our very first brand partner in some level. We actually bought an airbag, so we were more of a customer, um, but it was a partnership as well. They basically kind of helped us out, give us give us the ropes and stuff. But we paid for that video too, right? Like people don't say that; they don't even say that out loud. But the reality is that we paid money and we gave them cash to basically set up that whole uh, that whole video there where it's in the crane yard and everything cuz you know people have to do stuff stuff to get that video done so there's cost so that all came back onto us and uh, basically so and then we have bought an airbag I saw a video the way it started I just saw a video I was like oh my god this guy's hanging from his feet this guy named Danny really cool guy and he's hanging from his feet and uh, falls into the thing. I'm like, oh man, yo, I can do that. Bah, bah, bah. I'm going to go beat him. I'm going to go do all this cool stuff. I and mean, so Trish basically said, okay, let's start doing it. So we made a pitch deck and all that sort of stuff. Um, and they finally said yes after a bunch of times. And uh, we went over, shot the first video, got picked up by GoPro actually, um, and did quite well. And then we basically used that as a as a instigation for a second one. So we went back, I think it was maybe a year later when we were already working with some other guys. And we stopped by and did another one. And that's when, yeah, I went to 55 meters and basically beat Danny's record. And that video, yeah, it's hit like a million something views. And that, yeah, that one was like our first big one that really separated me from all the gymnastics people. Because for me, I wanted to do it. Yeah, I wanted to beat Danny, but I'm a naturally competitive kind of guy. Again, coming from that orphanage and just having to fight my entire life for every little thing. And that's fine. I have no problem with that. But the thing I really liked about it was just the idea that I could do something different. I don't want to just do the same Olympic routines over and over and over again. I wanted to show that you can take those skills and jump off a crane, but still use the same strategy, tactics, all that methodology that you learn in a confined gym. Well, why can't you apply it in a new environment? And that's, that's really what I wanted to prove for the first time. And it went off great. And that's, that's where it really set that I was now not one of them. I was a different species of well, God knows what it is, but it, it, I was <laughs> I wasn't one of them, and they knew that then. But that's where that's see that's when all of a sudden the po politics start arising. It's very easy when they just kick you off the team and you go nowhere, and then you become homeless, and they can say, "Ha ha, told you." But when you then they'll say, "Yeah, okay, that's what you guys going to do. You're going to lose an asset. Here we go. I'm going to do this. Boom, boom, bing, bang, boom." You know, and if you if they had combined what I was doing with what they already had in place for the last like 50 years or something through Team Canada, oh man, they would have done some really cool stuff, but they just weren't thinking that, you know? So um, then, yeah, that's, that's kind of the bag jump stuff. I went to Sweden and did one for 65 meters and all that. And um, by then, once I had done that one, then it was, I was getting calls. By then, by that third video, so we had the Devon video, the bag jump video. Uh, we had a, another one can't remember who it was with, but it did quite well. It was on someone else's blog, some Polish guy. Um, and so after three or four, then all of a sudden we started getting the following to get back, really roundabout way to get back to your original question, um, is that, you know, it was a slow growth. We didn't spike. No one spikes. Or not no one, but very few people spike. If you think you're going to go and get 7 million views and you're going to spike and all of a sudden you're good, well, you're, you're, you're smoking something, you know, and it just doesn't work that way. You know, it did work like anything new. It works back in 2007, 2008, 2009, Facebook, YouTube, all that sort of stuff was just getting going. If you're the first one to do it there, heck yeah. Right. So um, you got to look at it like that perspective. It's not just a one-time stunt that's going to ever do it for you. You might kill yourself doing it anyway. 
right? So that you got to watch out for that. So you you're, you should be expecting a a long slow haul in reality. It's gonna you're gonna have some blips like that, like a you know, ten million here, five million there, three million there, a documentary over there, a TV show over there, you know, blah blah blah. But at the end of the day, it's gonna be under all of those special moments that come fleeting. Um, it's going to be what's that value that you have underneath of all of that, and that's where freestyle trampoline and what I was pushing for actually was the thing that was building the brand. It wasn't. It wasn't just Devin. I didn't get one call from anyone that said, "Hey, I saw the Devin video. Uh, I would like to hire you for something." I saw there's a lot of people that reposted it, and it, it went all over the place. But that's through Devin's contacts. He has a whole contact list of media people that he sends it out to every time he makes a post. So that's not even that's that, that's him doing that. You know, so um, I, it's not, it, it didn't blow me up in that way, but it did do something which I believe is actually a lot more important. Um, de- it depends on how you define it and depends on the situation, of course, you know, but it gave me the, the keyword search for, you know, world's best trampoline. When you search that in YouTube, my video with Devin is going to come up in the top 10, no matter how you mix up those words. And that to me is something that doesn't go away. Mm-hmm. And you were saying that as you were doing all these videos that people started to call month after you put up three or four big viral videos. I know one of them was Das Super Talent, which is essentially like America's Got Talent in Germany, where you went and you did the gravity jump there. And then you came and you did it. You auditioned for America's Got Talent doing the gravity jump as well, right? Uh, yes. Well, when we did the Germany one, then uh, America's Cut Talent called us to then do the America's one. We got called by the UK as well for theirs, uh, but they didn't want to pay anything. So we said, no, thank you. That's fair. And so I want to ask you, talk to me about that night then when you actually did the jump. Like, I know you, you've done it before and DOS super talent, but you're going up. And I heard like when I watched back the clip and they're saying how the wind is 22 miles per hour. So when you're at the top there, how how much of a factor is wind when you make that jump? It's not a factor. And that's fake. That actually, they didn't have that. They, they didn't have the radio guy, you know, doing all that sort of stuff. They had one radio person um, that basically gets you there and is kind of like your handler, I guess. Uh, and each act had a handler kind of thing. Um, and basically, you, I just went up and they, they messed up the edit too, you know, and this is what people don't realize about TV. They mess up edits all the time. It, it's never real. It's never even close to being real usually, you know. And so uh, we basically, it wasn't really much. I basically just went up and they said, okay, we're going to go on half an hour. They basically say, okay, you're going to go on stage. I go on stage. I talk to them a little bit. They ask questions about stuff. Um, most of that, I don't think they used actually. And then uh, I go into the crane. Basically I go up. Um, I had my little mascot at the time, Dudley. We have a new mascot now, Freestyle Freddy. Um, but you know, it was just a way to kind of reach the kids. Cause at that time I was still doing like workshops and clinics and educational seminars and stuff like that. So I always had like a, a little stuffed animal that I could use to demonstrate with the kids and stuff like that. The kids love it, you know? And, uh, so do the older people, which is funny, but anyway, so we're going up and you know, they basically just, you get, you're on the radio and they just tell you whenever you're ready to go, go. And then it was just, and I just did the same thing. Uh, I did with the bag jump one in Austria, three, two, one. And that to me is my signal of shut down everything, you know, a a hypnotist might say you're getting into your perfect Zen sort of focus moment. um, And it's just repeat what I know in my brain on autopilot and get it done. And uh, I did compared to what I can do off of a crane and have done. That was easy. Like America's got time. They don't realize that that was easy stuff. You know, we could done way more if they wanted to, but they were too scared. They didn't want to go above 45 meters uh, just because of insurance. You know, Ellen DeGeneres called us up uh, before that and said, hey, come and jump off the Warner Brothers studio. And we just couldn't get the insurance for it. So, you know, there's you could probably see already where the, the, the gravity jump was destined to fail, you know, especially in America. Um, but yeah. And um, then I land. I get out. Nick Cannon, he's all he's all happy, you know, he's and he's like, oh, yeah, go, go, go. Blah, blah. We're hugging. Apparently, I didn't know we were supposed to hug and all that sort of stuff. But then uh, basically I go back up and I do my second one. Uh, Cause that was supposed to be a warm up, Right. So I just did like the double front half thing. And uh, the next one was supposed to be the triple flip. So I, it was all good to go. And then I, they basically just recorded me doing two jumps piece, uh, talking to them, the judges before and after, and then pieced it together. It wasn't actually too complicated. The whole thing didn't take more than half an hour. Um, and 
then yeah, they, they said, oh, you made it. We love it, blah, 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 which is kind of like what they say to like every act. You know, it's all pre, pre-done. So I get my, three, my four checks and uh, I'm thinking, I'm still a, a novice at TV at this point. So I actually think like, oh man, okay, I'm going to move on second round and we got to go to uh, the radio hall or what, I can't remember, radio music hall. I can't remember what it's called. But, uh, you know, we were going to New York and, oh, we're already making plans and this, that, and the other and blah, blah, blah. And then we just get a call back say, yeah, well, we can't do it because we can't fit your thing in the, in the hall. Uh, in New York. And I'm like, well, did, shouldn't you have figured that one out before you guys uh, said anything? Like, well, you know, you don't hear back from them. And then that's it. And then it's off to the next project. Mm-hmm. And then after that, I think, like you mentioned, you did some more videos with Devin. You participated in Nitro Circus, as we kind of talked about. And after that, too, something you did during that time, and you referenced it very early on in the interview, is you mentioned that you uh, did some charity work in Honduras and that's with your charity Seabound International. Can you kind of just share what work you're doing there? I know you donated a bunch of trampolines then you went in 2016 then went back in 2017 and did some lessons and stuff and workshops from there. Can you kind of talk about everything you're doing in Honduras? Well, yeah, unfortunately that project is on hold for now just because we're getting, let's say more committed partners. Um, but we basically, what we did is contact some companies that we were already working with, say, look, we want to start some trampoline out in Honduras. You know, my whole thing is to, if trampoline is going to be my thing, then I want to spread it out to the world and, you know, in any way that's accepting to everybody else, you know, not try to cram it down people's throats. But we have been contacted by someone in Honduras that said, hey, you know, it would be great for these kids, an activity and give them something to do. And, you know, Honduras was like the capital or murder capital of the world kind of thing. So they were looking for just something they could give kids. So we teamed up with a couple companies and said, okay, well, we're going to just donate stuff. We basically coordinated the whole thing. And then I went out and did some teaching there. I basically got them a structure so that they could teach the kids when I wasn't around and all that. And uh, it worked pretty well. Uh, and they're still doing it from from what I know. Problem is that like anything, if you're not constantly nurturing it, then it, it slowly dies. And uh, the people that we were partnered with really just weren't thinking long term. So that's that's kind of on the back burners right now, realistically. Fair enough. And then, so I want to kind of transition to more towards everything you're doing with the Freestyle Trampoline Association and where it really initially started was with, you threw an, you threw an event called the Garden Trampoline Games or the GT Games. And you were, guys were kind of blown away by the reception of that event, right? Yeah, a lot more than we realized. Like, like the way it started was that, again, like I said, I was doing all these workshops and clicks. Like, so we do like a big project once every month that'd be like a million views here or there. But then in between that, the only pay the bills is to travel around, do clinics with coaches and athletes and trampoline parks and garden trampoline manufacturers. So those are all more educational based things because that's what people are looking for. Um, and then basically from there, they said, OK, well, we want to target this new community called G-Tramp. I'm like, what's that? Gee, what? You know, so then it's like, okay. And I start seeing their videos. I'm like, oh, damn, these guys are sick. You know, these guys doing quad backflip this and all this crazy stuff that you just don't see in the Olympics. I was, I was used to just pointed toes and good pikes and whatever else. And it, this was completely out there. I was like, oh, God, this is, this is cool. This is Nitro Circus. This is freestyle, right? So I already kind of saw it saw in my head like that's very interesting. But my whole point to work with these guys was though to give them educational advice, not to make freestyle. But the way it actually ended up happening was that then they we sit down with their lawyers and everything saying, well, we have an educational program for you. We're ASTM certified. I'm a producing member of ASTM and this, that, and the other. ASTM, for your audience who don't know, is uh, basically the – oh, I don't remember the acronym, but it's all the manufacturing standards for all of America, right? So every trampoline has to be approved basically by them or you're really – open to a lawsuit so you know these are all the different boards that kind of make sure that all your hydro works properly and your taps work and all that that's what astm is so they have a branch for trampoline parks and garden trampoline so we sat down and said well we'll give you an education program problem in america which we didn't know until we learned which is why you really if you're going to learn about how the world works you can't learn it through a textbook you got to go sit down with the lawyers that actually make the decisions of what gets paid for what doesn't get paid for in some respect and realize what's actually going on because what they said was well you know we want people to be safe but i don't want to be responsible for it and at first you might scratch your head and say what's well, a 
that doesn't make any sense. Why would you have a product that you don't want to take responsibility for? You know, and that's, that's how I started. I'm like, that's, uh, that's dumb. That doesn't make any sense. You know, and I'm, I'm still not even laughing, thinking that, you know, these, these, these are just stupid people that they just don't know. But the reality was that that's just the way the industry is. And a lot of industries, not just the acrobatic one. So we're like, okay, but you still want us to help with education, but you're saying we can't give you education because then it increases your liability. Yeah. Well, what do I do then? What am I here for? Uh, I thought you would tell us that. I'm like, okay. So why? Okay, what do we do this? So we did a little creative thinking. We said, okay, well, what if we do this? We know that this community exists. You know, they we did some research on them. They started back in 2007, apparently, with some snowboarders. Uh, I think it was a, a group called Extreme Flippers, if I got my uh, my stats right. But they started back in 2007, and there's basically little pockets of uh, groups of kids that basically would do flips on the garden trampolines. As a group, like having fun, and one guy throwing a mat, the other guy's double bouncing the other one, the one guy's doing the split, the other guy's filming in, the other guy's playing the music, you know, pretty standard structure for these guys. And they would do that little bits throughout the world. But then through social Instagram, when Instagram started getting bigger, probably 2012, 2013, then all of a sudden it was like, and this was around that time when we were having conversations with this company and they're like, okay, what if what we did is say, Look, there's all these groups of athletes. Why not make an online competition, right? And make a submission base. Submit and you could win a free trampoline. It's really simple. But what that would do was bring the kids to us. What it did from an educational perspective would say, well, instead of everyone just kind of off on their own, why don't we bring them together, make a coalition, you call it the GT Games, and at least before, and any researcher knows this, before you start jumping to conclusions and making assumptions, you need to study the market, study the project, study the population, study whatever it is that you're researching. So for me, I'm going through, because I'm still, I, I finished university, so I'm looking at this as a researcher, because I was going to go for my master's and PhD before all this in exercise physiology, right? So I'm already kind of thinking along those lines. So I'm looking, okay, it's a research, this, this is ethology. Let's see what these people do. Let's bring them all together, do a call to action and put some trampolines around, not even anything fancy, you know, and just see what happens. Let's, let's just hope. All of a sudden, overnight, we had people from Israel messaging, parents from Australia, Europe, all over, and the actual hashtag we use for submissions got like something like two to 3,000 uh, hits just overnight, basically, within the first like week or, you know, whatever. And we're like, whoa, I didn't know this many people are doing that. Because in my head, I'm thinking, well, these are not even people in California. That's where it was, right? These are people all over the world saying, I want to come. And I was like, whoa, I didn't even know that there, you know, there was such a, like, this, they would care, right? So we're there scratching our heads trying to figure out what have we tapped into? We didn't even understand. <laughs> Basically, so yeah, so then we... Hosted the games, made it go, and then basically we started getting a whole influx of people. So we picked the top 50 and said, okay, well, you guys are going to compete, and we're going to give you guidelines. And the whole point of the guidelines, again, to make sure that they're being safe without just – you know, hucking and chucking, whatever, you know, they have, they have like 33% creativity, which is more safety oriented, i.e. more positions rather than just more flips. Yes, there is 33% to difficulty, so it doesn't look boring, right? But 66% is, you know, 33% is control, the other 33% is the creativity. And as long as we weigh it that way, then we're pushing more for them to, you know, be safer, low impact, just more fun and creative. Um, and that was how we we're trying to at least start with them. You know, they also didn't want to use throw mats. And we're like, guys, you got to use throw mats. You're going to wreck yourself. And they were there at first. They hated us. They're not hated us, but they just saw us as people that organized an event. And we were basically scum of the earth in some sense, not really scum of the earth, but we weren't cool yet. We just, we basically didn't know this community. Uh, they, some of them were even mad at me because I had uh, actually made fun of some of them without really thinking about it just before we got into the community. Oh, this guy landed on his head. Ha ha. You know, and that sort of stuff really just doesn't vibe with that community. And I was kind of learning, figuring it out. They were figuring it out. But after the event, we had, we had people who were awesome there. Fox news came out. We had a whole bunch of media outlets basically take it on and all of a sudden we're getting calls from europe park say hey why don't we host an event over here and i'm like what uh, yeah yeah let's do it blah, blah blah and all of a sudden literally within the that next couple months we basically organized the entire feeder system to three more gt games one in europe one in new zealand uh, because we already had so many contacts from traveling it really wasn't that hard to set it up uh, you know so we basically just started making calls and say let's go 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 and we called the the feeder system tramp champ 
just it was a fun name and catchy and cute and um that became little qualifiers all around the world and then the winners get to go to gt games plus the online version right and then within a year that was literally fully functional and operational we ran like literally 80 events in the first year just go 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 like a chicken with their heads cut off um and ever since then it's been solidifying figuring out all the things we need to know you know getting the educational programs for the kids getting the safety manuals for the kids and the parents you know we had to educate the parents on what's going on even more than the kids half the time i have interviews with parents saying i didn't know my kid was doing this he got hurt i wish there was online resources i say well we're going to make that so we spent two years developing all of that developing relationships with partners so then we ended up officially becoming like there we became the fta um once we got the feeder system in place and we just basically incorporated and said let's go and uh it was we you know uh, the social media people will know this way you know when you feel something you've caught on and you just run with it and you're like oh i know this some sums here i don't know what it is but something's here so we just basically it reinvested went all in again because we did that with the bag jump before we did another all in sort of moment, you know, like uh, I'm thinking Chris Tucker in Rush Hour 2, you know, the part at the end where he's just gambling like a crazy man. You know, we, we did another one of those. And honestly, it paid off because now we've been doing this for the last uh, three, four years. The system's complete. We have all our checks and balances in place. We have uh, the kids now flying around doing uh, content work for brands. So the FTA, based the Freestyle Trampoline Association, became an agency for the athletes to partner with brands. It became the event coordinator for about 50 to 60 events a year, plus, you know, all of our partner events, which are not, which, you know, depends on how we partner with them. Um, we have a full educational program online for basically any acrobat that wants to learn anything on trampoline, whether it's do it yourself or with the help of a coach. Um, and we, and we basically now coordinate all these guys and now we're scaling and we have a content team of about 50 guys all around the world that, partner with brands we have about 30 projects on the go right now working with the like a japanese tour the tv show like i mentioned we have a whole bunch of other brands are looking just for basic content other ones are asking us to take over their social media to basically build their tiktok account or this that or the other and it's a full-time program and we have about 50 we'll call them employees that's what a business person outside the community would say but for us they're content creators and they give us a lot of value and we make sure that the brands appreciate that value and we become i don't know how much history your your uh, audience would know but uh, think like the teamsters you know in the 50s 60s or 20s 30s all that sort of stuff um really becoming the unions we become like a union for these kids to partner them with brands give them a, a platform to really do their sport and that sport is now called g tramp or freestyle trampoline which is basically interchangeable and for you personally how does it feel to be pioneering a new sport that's gaining traction around the world? Uh, really stressful, and I want to smash my head into a wall most of the time. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, the people people don't understand. Like, it's it's not like you know. And this again to all you young social media guys out there that think you're going to make a career in social media, it's it's a battle. It's really, and thank God I've been fighting my entire life. I would literally have been beaten down either by my enemies or by myself just because of the sheer weight of everything. But you got to understand, like a couple of dynamics are being at play here. I'm the guy that got kicked off Team Canada because I basically saw a better future for the whole sport that said, you know, screw you guys, I'm going home, you know, like South Park, you know, but instead of going home and just going away, I got louder and stronger and faster and better and smarter and all these and learned from different people and built a like literally manually, literally manually built a reputation step by step um, that my industry still is like, oh, damn, okay, he actually went and did it. So that creates a lot of political tension because we know the top players on both sides of the communities. Uh, from the guys at the FIG to the guys, you know, that work, uh, that play at Travis's house all the time. You know what I mean? And you're playing this fine line because the old guy's basically saying you're basically making our sport look dumb and you're basically ruining our sport because of insurance. And people now think that a trampoline is crazy and these, these uh, you know, extreme kids are going to destroy our sport because now that's what people are seeing. And I'm like, well, you know, that's, that's not my problem at the end of the day. These kids are doing it before I did. You know, I, I actually kind of joined in after the fact so if you're gonna blame me then that's fine but at the end of the day i'm coming in after the fact trying to give a structure to kids and i'm actually doing what your job technically is 
So from the political side, I'm I'm getting a lot of poo-poo from uh, a certain number of individuals. Not a lot of them are actually on our side, but you got to understand the gymnastics world, the traditional world. Like, have you seen Athlete A? That's a brand new Netflix. No, no, I haven't. Well, if you want to know what the community is actually like, watch that. And our community, and my, the traditional guys will say, oh, that's not everybody. And they're right. It's not everybody. But it's there's even if you take out all the issues with the whole Larry thing and it, you just focus on just the culture, even without that, you know, let's call it a really bad day. You know, it's still like that. And it's just it's not it's not open to new ideas and stuff. They're getting better. But they're very slow. They've been around since, you know, they got put into the Olympics but when the Olympics was first revived in like 1896, right? So they got grandfathered in just because of national pride and the way it worked with Greece and all this sort of other different stuff, which I'm not going to get into. But they got grandfathered in. So they kind of – there's almost this mantra like they deserve it. And, you know, I have guys on my podcast saying, well, us gymnasts, we're special. And there's, there's that, that special attitude. They, they do think they're special. And basically – I'm saying, well, you're not that special. You're actually not that great. Your social media stats are going down. You got off the air when you used to be on TV, and now you're not. Your seats are emptying. Here's the articles that show that all your own athletes are saying the same thing, blah, blah, blah. So I'm, I'm like the John McEnroe that's basically saying, what are you guys doing? You're not that great. You got a lot of work to do. We don't need to throw insults. But at the same time, you, you guys need to realize that you're not perfect. And um, they have a hard time doing that. So you can understand that there's definitely a political issue there and it wouldn't be political if i wasn't being somewhat successful obviously we have a lot to grow but it, it wouldn't be political unless they actually were threatened in some level of it right so there's that fight and the i get messages from other people oh i hope you break your neck you're inspiring kids to die they should get in, get a real professional coach to train them like me you know i'm like okay and the, the, the problem is that they're missing the whole point which is the reason that those kids are going to the backyard is because you are who you are because your culture is now plastered all over Netflix, you know, that's, that's why those kids aren't doing that, you know? So for you to say that they should, should do it because you think they should means you're missing the entire problem and you're, you're, you're missing it, you know? And that's, so that's a huge fight, right? But we are winning and we are getting more and more supporters from that side. Um, and they, they, behind the scenes, they talk to me very openly, just on, just on line, they get very critical because, well, they, it's, like, you know, anyone that does basic psychology knows, you know, you go on your social media and when you want to rant about something, you, you go into a group with all your buddies and you find the weakest thing and you just poke fun at it, right? That's all they can do because they don't really have any other plan of attack. So, but that gets annoying, but you learn to just kind of block it out and say whatever. But then you also have the kids on the other side. So that's a traditional one, but then you have the kids that, you know, some of them just are expecting a handout. Oh, you're going to build my community for me. You're going to do all the work and you're just going to give me money. Uh, no, Johnny, that's not how this works. This is an investment, you know, and getting them to under the kids to understand that it's an investment, it's a business. And if you want to flourish, you need to look at it like a business, you know, and that's where Trish, I'm using the same thing Trish taught me back in the day. And we're now reteaching that to a, a much wider audience, you know, a lot more kids, but basically the same exact thing Trish taught me, we're now teaching them. And that is a process, you know, these, uh, they're doing amazing. And considering it's only been a couple of years, these kids are kicking butt, right? And the brands are doing really well and we're, stru we're structuring everything, but there's definitely a learning process there of how to be safe, not wreck yourself. Cause it just takes one big injury at one of our events and the whole thing goes implodes, right? So I'm, I'm walking a very thin line and a very big gamble because my entire reputation with one, one slip of a, a tuck jump, you know, by accident on a quad, that there goes my reputation completely at one of our events, right? So there's a huge risk that we're trying to tighten it up so that we can control it. We're training these guys to act and behave like a sporting community. And that is way harder than people realize. Just the back and forth, just the, the, every kid messaging, uh, you know, not paying attention to even the links that you put in your bios, you know, so they're not even paying attention. So you're trying to babysit some kids sometimes. And then one says, want this, and then you'll go to an event and some kid will uh, basically glorify an injury. So they'll have an injury like on their, uh, on their ankle or something. They'll have like a wrap. But one of these kids then put it around his neck, took a screen grab and said, broke my neck at the GT games. And he didn't. He just said because it was just clickbait. Well, now what do I do? Now all of a sudden we look like we're breaking children, even though it's not even the case, right? So these are the kind of things that we are battling with, right? But then on the other side, we have the brands and the brands are looking at the kids as basically creating a market for them. They're working together. The brands support them. The kids 
kind of work for them. They're like content creators. They build the content for the brands that use that to, uh, you know, sell their products. And then they reinvest that back into the community. It's a cycle. And that's kind of like how all business and sports cycles work, but just getting them to realize it's a sport mentality and trying to get all the different brands. We work with like probably a hundred brands around the world all the time, all looking for their own piece of the market, their own piece of the pie, their own unique campaign that doesn't infringe on somebody else because everyone's unique, which is very fair from their perspective, but very hard for us to coordinate because it's such a complex web. And so again, another roundabout way of answering your question is that it is the most complicated thing I've ever done. And I had no idea how complicated it would be, but it is fun. I, I love it. It's game. It's a game theory. I love game theory. It's just, it's go, go, go playing chess, whatever you want to, you know, um, go like the Chinese game, you know, it's, it's all that sort of business strategy stuff. And you're doing it all the time with a hundred thousand kids, a hundred different brands and potentially, you know, you know, literally the whole world. And you're trying to coordinate into some kind of platform or structure that is coherent to people that, don't do it already, right? It's very easy when you're in the community, you get it. But to sell it and then turn around, package that somehow and then be able to sell it to, to a brand, that's tough because the brand's like, what the heck is this? Because I could word it one way. You say, oh yeah, it's a bunch of kids that jump around their backyards doing flips and stuff to music. Well, I can't really sell that. But if I spin it around and do some fancy marketing and, pro and promote these guys purposely as athletes, then all of a sudden the brands are, oh, you're getting the what top 50 guys all across the U.S. to come to compete in a showdown? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. I'll pay for that. Right. And so it's figuring out what the brands want to hear, what the athletes want to hear, what I want to hear, you know, in our business. Because well, this is one part of our business. We own a portfolio of stocks and bonds and real estate and a bunch of other investments and stuff like that. So, you know, it, it's, it's a 24-hour a day job. And you're, you're getting to the point where you literally fall asleep out of exhaustion, wake up two hours having a nightmare about something you forgot to do, quickly writing down a note to do it or sending the email right then and there, falling back to sleep and then doing that a couple of times, you know, a night until and forever. And that's, that is, that, that's the stress. And that comes with the territory because you can't have a fun life where you travel around and do projects if you're not going to have the stress of what if they don't work, you know? And that's, so that's, that's kind of what it's like. Mm -hmm. And I want to get into growing the sport using social media. Before that, I'm curious about the long-term, kind of your long-term vision for, for freestyle trampoline. Like, is you, do you one day want to see it in the Olympics or is that kind of almost the opposite of what you're looking at? Does that like bring it too much towards traditional trampoline and the world that you left in order to start freestyle trampoline? So like, what's kind of your long-term vision of the sport? You know, yeah, that's, it's a good question. Right now, the long-term vision would be actually more like X Games. And um, maybe selling it to a brand that's just, you know, a TV show, stuff like that. So we're working on creating a TV show. We're working on creating a full world championships where we actually have a big convention center. And, you know, you bring in 5,000 people from all around the world uh, just for this one simple thing, you know. And we're still at that phase where we got to develop all of that. This is brand new. Like, you got to think, like, this is snowboarding back in the 60s. Right. So that's it's there's the infrastructure is still new. We're the only ones building the infrastructure. So it will take 30, 40, 50 years. Luckily, I'm 30 years old. So I got the time, hopefully, knock on wood. <laughs> and and um, but long term, I'd like to see it in the X Games um, or something like that, because what I'm seeing the whole social media world changing to the point where uh, people aren't running to try to make a sport in the X Games or in the Olympics, you know. Traditional sports will try to go to the Olympics, and you can see a big push for a whole new wave of sports in the last few years. But like, you could easily go to Red Bull, and we already talked to Red Bull all the time, but we could easily go to Red Bull and say, okay, well, you're going to basically buy freestyle trampoline as a series the way they did with Red Bull cliff diving, and they've already offered that. We just got to tighten up the structure and all that, you know, and then we just sell it off to them, and then that's that simple. They basically take it off our hands, and um, – we help make sure it runs smoothly, but then I move on and I own a, a restaurant and I'll, I will, I'll keep it. I'll make sure that we don't want to sell it too early. I don't want to just sell off to a brand for just some small little amount of money that don't, don't really commit to it. We're thinking about franchising the entire community to our partners where then it becomes an investment for them rather than just a paying for marketing sort of thing. But you know, these are all, you can't tell what you're going to do. It's very, very tough. So 
I'm open to going to the X Games. I'm even open to the Olympics. You know, when I started, I sat down with the Australian uh, president of the gymnastics guys. But when we did the Nitro Circus thing in Australia, and uh, he basically said, yeah, if you're going to make this thing a thing, don't go to the FIG. Go away. Do it yourself. Because then by the time you build it yourself, then they have to play your game. Otherwise, they're just going to twist and turn you and then kick you out and take all your money. And I was like, oh, okay. So let's not do that. So I, have, I'm, I don't know where we're going to sell it, how we're going to sell it, because it could just become a TV show, right? And I have a thought about doing a TV show style where it's like through the parks and stuff like that. But again, it's so early. We can't activate those quite yet. This is a, it's a new startup sort of uh, community. How, in terms of growing the sport, talk to me about how you guys are growing the sport right now. Is it all through social media or is there some importance with partnering with trampoline parks and stuff to grow the sport? Is it when, in terms of trying to grow the sport, is it just education that the sport exists or how it works? Like kind of talking about this challenges you're facing of growing the sport right now. Yeah, there's a lot of challenges. As I mentioned, a few of them, political safety, just education, all that. I would say, though, um, I guess the more interesting part would be that it's the coordination between all the different brands and getting them all to agree on something. You know, there's a good story from uh, JP Morgan when he was basically bailing out the uh, American economy back when, uh, I don't remember exactly when, but they're were, they were in poo poo and uh, JP Morgan was the big man with the railroads and all that sort of stuff. Um, and uh, he basically sat down all, all these banks and stuff like that all in one room, shut the door and said, no one's leaving this room until we all come to an agreement on how we're going to bail out the government, basically. I don't know all the details, so sorry for anyone that if, they, if I'm missing a piece of that, but that's basically what happened. And I totally understand what he was doing. Like trying to get these guys all to agree is tough. So what we do is we basically say, okay, well, we're going to have these three events. We have GT Games uh, USA, uh, Europe, and New Zealand. We have the feeder system, which is about 10 to 15 events uh, all around each of those continents, and they all kind of feed to it. So that's that's pretty signed, sealed, and delivered. Our athletes are running the events, so I don't actually have to run them. We There's a lot of events where we, I don't even go to it anymore, and they, they run those ones. I just go to the big ones. So it's, it's that scaling and teaching the athletes how to run their own events because if it's by the athletes for the athletes, then ultimately what's going to happen is I'm going to take an exit, and I'm going to – basically just maybe take royalties or something like this, some form of them. And the athletes are going to be expected to kind of run it into the future where I'm going to move on and do other investments. Because like I said, once you kind of figured it out, I'll get bored real fast and I want to start something completely new. Like, you know, and um, so I have to coordinate all those people into long-term contracts where they're all kind of nervous. They don't know what they're doing. And they're like, well, is this going to work? What if I get an injury, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, well, you know, and I have to, I have to basically go, uh, Brian Tracy on these guys and just do sale, sale, sale. And that's my job is I just do sales all day long, basically making sure that everyone and not just sales, like cold call sales, like sales, as in people that I know really well that I'm trying to now get them to now do this franchise deal. And I have to now walk them through all the numbers and figure out, well, this is actually going to make sense to them. And do they see a long-term benefit, blah, blah, blah. But then you have other people that now want to open gyms with us. And we're like, well, do we really want to do that? And do we want to go under that kind of issue because that's 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 a bit of a bottleneck sometimes depending on how you do that one right so all the different opportunities that are coming at us we have to find a way to schedule them coordinate them with everybody without dropping somebody because you're so new that if you drop a brand it's very obvious and then the other brands know and they go oh what happened what happened right and from there then you're you're all you're kind of backpedaling so we can't drop any brands and right now we haven't actually we've only dropped one brand which is funny is the brand that started the whole thing back in 2017 but they had some other internal issues you know going on that had actually nothing to do with us which is why it never really caused a backlash to the community but that would have been a big problem you know so we've been able to build 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 and get more partners so I'm out there selling and trying to coordinate each one of them like let's say it's a park so we work through the parks. The parks offer a shelter. They offer uh, food and beverages and all this sort of thing. There's a big, long contract that they have to sign and all the different stuff that they have to agree to before we go. But I have to make sure that they're happy with their events and their competitions. And I have to make them online content uh, schedule of like, you know, 50 videos over the year. And I have to then find all the athletes that are going to make those videos and figure out who's getting paid what. And how do I leverage that against another brand that actually already has an athlete that's signed to their contract? But blah, blah, blah. And you can see how it gets so convoluted that's that's my job now is to make that simple and very easy like a a ball of yarn that just you can't tell where one string ends and the other one 
begins and, and open it up into a nice web where everyone can see exactly where, you know, the spider web is going. And that's, that's the, the challenge. Okay. And talk to me a little bit more about the community online and kind of your, your personal approach to social media. I find it interesting. Like I was looking at your Instagram, you have over 200,000 followers, you're verified, but your account isn't just specifically about you. Like you make your account about the community. Essentially you treat your account like a curation account at this point and you're finding the best videos of freestyle trampoline and other extreme sports on the internet and sharing them onto your account. I'm curious as to why that's kind of your strategy. That strategy happened because of Devin. <laughs> no offense, Devin. I love you, Devin. But I, it kind of happened because I started getting on these TV shows and stuff like that. And I literally couldn't post stuff because you're under an NDA and everything and you can't just talk about it. So all of a sudden, I'm, you know, I'm traveling here, traveling there. And everyone's saying, keep your mouth shut. We, we can't release it yet. We have to go into production and all this. And I'm like, oh, so what do I talk about? And the problem is that I didn't want to give away my position because I knew that I was in, about to be in a very big political battle and, and you know when it's about to hit the fan so i'm like, okay i don't want to give it away because i know i know there's a bunch of snakes in the grass on the traditional side they're looking just to find openings just to really you know get at me right so i don't want to tell people what i'm doing right i like to be a little more behind the scenes i don't like being in front of the camera i don't like vlogging i can because i know how to do it i'm trained to do it i'm a coach i know how to be very good with my words when i need to like any marketing person is but then they don't like it I know that's just part of the job. What I like is to see people succeed. I like to see the cool stuff that people are doing, right? There's this one guy, Luke Akins, who jumped out of a, an airplane and into a giant net, no parachute or anything. He jumped and had some guys hold him and they, they let him go and then he fell the rest of the other, I don't know, 10,000 feet or whatever it was into this big giant net, right? That's cool. That's what I want to see. I want to see people use science, use their brains, not just willy nilly throw themselves off of cliffs and stupid stuff, but I want to see someone put together a cool stunt that takes that kind of, you know, you know, uh, skill. So what my social media became was two pronged is a, I don't want to be in front of the camera. So let me repost stuff. B, um, reposting was actually, I was the first, not the first, but one of the first repost accounts for acrobatics. So everyone knew they could come to me to see all the cool stuff. And from there just sort of grew and the followers went, and everyone liked that because it was one central hub for all the cool stuff where, you know, a lot of people just talk about themselves and the reality, and this is a thing Trish taught me is that no one cares about who you are. And that's the sad part. And it's, and people will say, well, people care about my brand. No, they don't. They care about what your brand will do for them. It's all about what your what problem are you solving? What service are you providing? What, you know, what do you have to give your audience? For me, it was inspiration because that's what I always wanted. I'm a guy that kind of came from a rough sort of start. And I just, I just, I live in this perpetual positive state with only positive type music. I don't listen to the radio because it's all love songs of people breaking up and hating their lives and stuff. I'm like, oh, geez, this is sad. I, I just stay away from that. I just, I live in this perpetual motion of positivity. So I wanted my social media to kind of reflect that because I actually believed in that. Right. But then it also became then when we started getting more followers, people were like, oh, okay, can you give me a step up? You know, I'm trying to grow my social media account. Like, oh, there's a value. Okay, well, yeah, I'll, I'll tag you and all that. No, I, oh my God, I got another 200 followers. I got another this. And another, yeah, yeah, here you go. Here you go. And then all people started looking at us as a stepping stone to help their careers, which kind of makes sense when now how to see where we've taken this to now getting them brand endorsements, uh, getting them TV shows, getting them, you know, whatever else. And so it all kind of came from really a necessity of not being able to talk and having to fill my social media. So I didn't have months of nothing on there, but also my own personal sort of, I want to just look at the positive, cool new things that people can do in the world. And that sort of all came together kind of accidentally. I, I don't believe you know, people, Oh, I have this perfect plan for my social media. No, you don't. You have no idea how people are going to react to your social media. You, you think one way and they act another. So, and so we kind of played with it as we went, but you will see though, in all reality, our, our, the repost account has flatlined, and this is what social media is like. It's, it's a new wave. So now all of a sudden we're on TikTok, right? Because they're like, oh, well, it's flatlined. So we just stay around 200,000, and we've been there for like a year, right? Just not growing because people aren't going to Instagram as much uh, anymore for that sort of stuff. Everyone's on TikTok. So what did we do? Oh, we started a TikTok account. And within the first week, we got literally like 40,000 followers, right? And that's because we know how social media works. We know what buttons to press, what kind of content to make. So you always got to be looking for that new one. So I'm always looking for the next wave so I don't commit too much. 
So we have our own podcast, The Row Show. It's a freestyle sports podcast where I interview a lot of different cool athletes and leaders of all different aspects of these industries. But we didn't do that because, you know, I just got time to burn. <laughs> no, we did that because we knew that podcasts were getting bigger due to the whole corona and all this sort of stuff. And just long form media is getting more popular as people want more in depth discussions like this. This is great because you get to feel the emotion of the person. It's not just a quick little comment on Facebook. So we are, again, making another bet, you know, another 10 hours a week bet, we'll call it, if I have to quantify it, that eventually on podcasts are going to be, you know, very highly rated. And there's going to be tons of people using that long form. And we did that simply to capture up those keywords. So if you look now, we have the top rated freestyle sports podcast. It's number one there whenever you put in freestyle sports, right? So we did that on purpose before everyone else did, because we looked at the market, saw there's no one grabbed that real estate, we'll call it. Um, we grabbed it up and said, okay, this is mine now. Everyone else can have fun and I'm just going to build it. And But I have no control if it's actually going to pop off or if it's just going to you know, die. So it's always that kind of game. Mm-hmm. And you mentioned there in terms of the podcast, it's a, it's a 10 hour per week investment. If you were to estimate how much time you put into social media and all of that, how much time a week would you say you're doing total? Because I did, I looked at you. So your Instagram at the time that I wrote my notes down had 6,590 posts. If you were to start, when you started your account on May 24th, 2013 was the first post. That's at least still up on the account. That's two and a half posts every single day without missing a day since 2013. It's like, how much time are you spending finding the videos, reposting the videos? Like you said, you're on Instagram, but you're also on TikTok. And now you have this podcast. How much time goes into all of that? It's a full-time job, but we also have athletes that help us create the content, right? So like I used to do it all myself the first, I don't know, five years or so, but in the last couple of years, I've been able to kind of give it to the crew and give it to our athletes and stuff where they kind of help out with that. And I just, once in a while, I'll go and find something, but you also got to remember is that people will then send me stuff. So I just go through my DMs and all of a sudden, oh, here, try this, try this. And I just got to filter through them. And say, oh, okay, this one's cool, you know. And then I make a little, quick little video. It doesn't take me more than an hour to get one up. But again, that's like you said, two and a half hours a day, um, every day, right? So, I, and I'm pulling in 18 hour days, like like 15 to 18 hour days, legitimately. And then when I'm not working, like actually, like right before this, I'm writing up um, a big proposal for you know one of our projects and that's going to take me six hours to do that and get all the stats and stuff but then i got to make a post and even though i'm like oh i'm i'm so focused on this i don't want to take my attention away to now find some posts oh damn it you know and i'm like oh and then i get pulled back and then there's a phone call and guys are well i want to talk about this but i'm I'm not here tomorrow so then i'm coordinating we're coordinating with people all around the world because we have we go to like 30 countries a year so everyone's in their own time zones and it's always funny that you got to make it available for their time zone, and never your own, which is always funny, right? So you're coordinating all of this, and it is it is literally 15, 18 hours a day. I, I'm up at literally like four o'clock in the morning, and I try to get through a whole bunch of different stuff uh, through before eight or nine o'clock because that's when people get up and they start answering emails. And I know that my day is going to hell when uh, when that happens because everyone's going to pull you one direction or another. So then all of a sudden, from you know nine, ten o'clock, it's being pulled around until about four or five o'clock and then you have calls in between all that and then all of a sudden oh well now we have to have a team meeting because everyone else needs to know what they're doing tomorrow so all of a sudden it's seven o'clock and i was like oh hey i just got an email from this person they need this oh well now all of a sudden it's t- nine o'clock again p.m right and you're still not quite done and then you're like oh crap i haven't eaten anything and you're like oh i i, I, I won't eat i'll just put a, a a hot pocket in the microwave while i'm doing then you forget the hot pockets in there because you all of a sudden as soon as you take your mind away from the hot pocket you get back to an email while the hot pocket is cooking and now 3 hours go by and you're like oh crap i ruined another hot pocket you don't know know how many food how much food i just burned through by literally just not eating it because i forget i started it <laughs> you know and it, you live like that and then i i basically fall asleep if I'm lucky, I'll have a, a beer or two and then watch an interview because then I'm, I have to do research now because I need to keep ahead of the game. So now uh, every every month I'll have a new like uh, lecture series that I'm watching, whether it's Chinese politics or union psychology or this or that. And I'll have that. And it's a regular thing. And I take my notes and I, like I'm in school. I'm giving myself school homework. And I even follow the curriculums and all that sort of stuff just because it's good for my my structure. But then it's 12 o'clock and I have four hours and I'm up again. Right. And that's, that's, that's how the day really goes all the time. And with kind of you saying how your Instagram account right now, it's slowing down. You've been stuck at the, around the 200,000 follower mark for over a year now. 
do you look back on the time you put in to growing an Instagram to a point where now today it's just not working the same way it was? Is it almost, do you look at it like a waste of time or does that investment of time on Instagram benefit you in other aspects when you go to a platform like TikTok? Now you have five, six years of learning from Instagram. Like how do you look at Instagram and your time you invested into it now with it not getting the same results it used to? You know, it's, it's a, that's kind of asking the half of the glass half empty or half full, right? And for me, it's always half full. Right. It's always, there's always more there. So yeah, I got to put in time and in my head, I'm like, well, I'm not actually increasing my stats, but at the same time, the Instagram is the New York times said it, you know, G tramp is a sport that was born on Instagram. So I, I have to maintain that to even be able to be able to utilize that quote from the New York times. I have to maintain it. So that right there, it already makes it worth it. Right. Cause you get to kind of use that and you ping that out at the right times for the brands. And then you say, okay, well, yeah, but look at all the other accounts that are popping up. So again, it goes back to just jumping on the wave. I, d- I never feel bad about doing work. If you're, if you're the type of person that looks and say, oh, I'm wasting my time because I'm not progressing. Well, that's, that's your problem really, because that's saying that you're not reading the markets correctly. I knew Instagram was going down. That's why we end up taking three, four months to start our podcast. I could have done that and said, well, you know what? Instagram, it's not working. So I guess what I'll do is just try a new strategy. But again, trying to read the markets, I say, ooh, there's no strategy that's going to work with what I'm willing to do here. So let's find a new wave. All right, well, TikTok is big, right? And there's like, a, I don't know, 140 million hashtag uses for my community just, just on that alone in TikTok. And it goes to China, India, Indonesia, all those countries which don't have this sort of stuff. So right now, it's a, it's a, it's a feasting frenzy for, for any acrobatic online kind of person. We call them flippers. Right. So for my community, right, they call them flippers. And, you know, so it's a freestyle frenzy, really, literally. And we, so we said, okay, we're going to jump on there. We created a content team and literally blew up overnight. On the second video, we got like 5 million views just because we knew what they were looking for, you know. And then, but from there, you have to set a tone. And this is the thing there's people that run around looking for clickbait and looking for that one video that has 5 million views. But then there's other ones that try to tell a story, right? And we are trying to tell a story. So even though I've plateaued on Instagram, I've still overall grown double in the last year, right? To about half a million followers when you add up everything, right? So you can't look at it like, oh, I live on this account. Not, not at least not from my perspective in this day and age, watching this for the last 10 years, it used to be that way when social media was new. And you, as long as you basically got first one to that real estate, we'll call it, then all of a sudden you were fine. But now everyone has their own real estate and just like division of labor, it all gets fractionated into smaller, smaller chunks. So you have to be, it's more about now the story that's going to get out there. Your, your, your viral video will be random at this point, not completely random, but at this point, it's basically random. Like this one guy was dancing on Facebook and it was his own personal account it hit like 5 million views, you know, before that wouldn't have happened. But the, the way that everyone's now on social media throwing different stuff, it's uh, the wild, wild west. And the only thing that stays there is the things that test the time. It's the things that have a story that then brands say, hey, there's a story here. It's not just clickbait. It's a story. Now that's what's happening. So if you're a social media person just looking for that next trend, that next hashtag that's trending right now or the next hot topic, that's not going to work, uh, at least not from my perspective. I'm sure you'll get someone like Gary V or someone that might change it. But at least from my perspective and seeing what I've seen in, in social media, that doesn't work. You need to be able to have an underlying story. And then, yeah, from there, jump on some a Gary V podcast or jump on uh you know a, a Tony Robbins sort of thing and another project we're working on you know yes on top of it but that's that's secondary now is you need a product and one thing I, it was it always stuck with me and I was like oh you know Trish I, I got to get sponsors I got to do this I got to blah 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 and this is back when I first started and she's like Greg why do you need sponsors I'm like what do you mean how do I get paid if I don't have sponsors and she's like does Steve Jobs have sponsors is the only reason that Steve Jobs is successful is because he had Red Bull pay for it? Uh, no. Well, and that's the reality. And I, I always remember that because it basically means if you don't have an underlying value or product to your social media that relates to real world stuff, right? You can't just live through online. Some of these kids say, oh, well, I, I spend my time entertaining people. Well, that's what Comedy Central is for. So maybe try something else, a little bit more creative, right? You got to find something unique. So that's where you go and go, okay, I have to now build something, but there has to be that value underneath. That's a real business value. Social media is no different than the real world. 
the kids interact and live on social media the same way that we do. Do you guys have a police station? I have a police station. It's called this one account that I basically have hired to make sure that they are now the police officer of the community that keep me informed on what bullying is going on and what bullying isn't happening and keeping sure that everything's safe and positive. And that's their job. That's my police station for this virtual community. Oh, okay. Well, what about parents? They don't know what they're doing. Well, I have a parent liaison. They have their own account, right? And they do this kind of products or this type of service for parents. Right? We have an educational account. We have a, an events account. We have a, an athlete account. So all the different things, when you go to a city and you look and there's a hospital and a school and a, you know, a, a music hall and all this sort of stuff, we have all that. And we've artificially made that online, right? So when you look at this, the social media world, you can't look at it like it's a different world. It is the real world, at least to these kids. Mm -hmm. And one thing I'm curious too, with everything you're doing and everything you're building on social media, it's all for the community, the freestyle trampoline community. But like you mentioned that there's a chance that you move on after freestyle trampoline into other interests and other endeavors, but all the work you've done thus far is building a community and social media accounts for freestyle trampoline. So is that ever a concern for you if you were to ever go and explore something else that everything you've built online to this point is for trampoline, you'd basically be starting from scratch on social media? No, because I, for me, I like acrobatics. So it's not like I'm going to go into um, giraffe riding. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm not going to do some of that. I'm, I'm going to stay acrobatic. So if I open a restaurant, um, then it will be have an acrobatic theme. You know, maybe it's a history of acrobatics with with stuff on the walls, and maybe it's all the places that I've traveled around, and I kind of do a uh, some sort of version of their foods and the, so we can say and you have some cool marketing that goes on the uh, the menus that has pictures of some of our events and stuff and say hey we did this event and had this type of food so i can give that connection and engagement to so it's, there's still acrobatics in it you know if i go to space i'm bringing a trampoline with me if i'm going to a restaurant business i'm bringing a trampoline with me in a sense you know if i'm going to start uh, we have a mascot freddie like i said well, I can mass produce Freddy's and our own merch line and all that, but it's again acrobatic based. So I, I stay anchored to my true passion, um, which is my strength and all that sort of stuff. I won't get away from that because that I think would be a, a foolish endeavor, like you said, I'm restarting. Um, but I, I'm not worried about it because I've already thought of all the different industries. I'm, I even thought about making a, a stock, like a, a bank for acrobatics and make my own um, like uh, currency. Just for the community, the the way you would have tokens that uh, you know represent a value at like an arcade and stuff like that, like all these kind of different things that allow me to dabble in literally any industry I want, but I can still find a way to bridge it back to my anchor point, which is acrobatics. So no, I'm not worried. That's fair. And so like in terms of, I know we kind of talked about freestyle trampoline, but for yourself personally, I know the answer is probably you're still figuring it out. But what is if you could pick, like what is your long time long term goal? It's that one thing you're striving for at the end of the day. Oh, it depends on how philosophical you want to go. If if you laid me down in front of Freud, I'd probably end up saying something like, I just want to have my voice heard. And I don't want to be the guy that just shoved in an orphanage, not listened to as a kid, uh, that kicked off Team Canada because I had different views uh, that they just didn't understand or even bother to really pay attention to. Not that I approached them in the most, let's say, business-like manner, being, you know, only 16, 17, 18 at a time, but still, you know, getting your voice heard. And if from a psychological perspective, I would say that would be my, my, let's say, subconscious saying that. And my conscious side of me says, I look at this as a business. I like building businesses. I like to see them build. I like to see them even fall. I like to see them get changed. I like to see the movement. I like to see progression. I like to see what could be done. And that, that just that, that wonder is what really fuels me, I would say. That's awesome. Before I let you go, I ask everybody the same standard set of questions. I used to call it rapid fire. But most people say that these aren't really rapid fire questions. So then I changed the name to a Q&A. But then I realized this is a podcast and the whole thing is a Q&A. So I don't really have a name for this section. Okay. But the first, the first question is you're going to dinner. You can take three people. It can be anybody dead or alive. Who do you take to dinner? Ooh, um, I will say this because I don't believe that there's anyone alive that is worth listening to in some long-term respect because they haven't tested the test of time yet, right? So I'm looking at things like what has lasted forever that people are still doing that must mean is wired into them at a real deep level, no matter what the political strife is of the day, right? So I'm naturally always looking into the past for stuff. So I would say 
Carl Jung for sure. That guy is awesome. Uh, dream, interpretation of Dreams or Dream Interpretation, whichever way it goes, really good book. Um, I would say uh, Tesla because he's an engineer and I want to see how he did it. And then I guess Einstein simply because, you know, one's practical, one's psychological. Um, and then Einstein is more theoretical, you know, shooting toward the stars, you know, and all that different uh, relativity and all that. So I'm hitting kind of a trifecta of different aspects that I believe all come together to create progress. You need the theory, you need the crazy guys that are going to do it, but you need the people that are going to make actual machines like Tesla and all that sort of stuff that actually do something. So um, I would like to talk to all three of them together and, you know, see what they would think about the way the world is now. What's some of the best advice you've ever gotten? Uh, I got a lot of good advice over the years. Some I sadly haven't listened to as much as I should. Uh, but um, I would say the best advice is look at sport as a business. I never did. As most athletes, we don't. We don't. We're, we're just we're in a, a culture, and the culture is you know basically top down sort of stuff. And you're not asked to think about those things. You never think to think about those things. But once you really realize everything's a business. Um, in sport, then all of a sudden it makes more sense why the federations behave in the way they do. They're just like everybody else, just looking for their own money. They say the nice marketing things. By the end of the day, they're just looking for that paycheck from the IOC, and that's fine. And we're all doing that. So I can't even blame them for it. You know, like everyone is a little capitalist from a biological game theory sort of way. Every single thing you do, like even Jacob, when you're talking to somebody, you are using game theory to pick what to say, how to say it based on the reaction that they're doing. You're playing chess every single time you interact with a human being at any level, right? And once you really understand that A, it's like that in sports and B, like that just with human interaction, whether it's your spouse, your kids, your employers, your boyfriend, girlfriend, uh, best friend, whatever it is, stranger, you're using that capitalistic biology to make a calculation of how to behave. Now, that sounds cold-hearted at the start. But when you realize that that's actually a good thing, then you realize you get to learn how to control yourself, i.e. you're lying to yourself every five seconds, right? just like everyone else is kind of manipulating the situations as well, right? So you learn to appreciate other people more because you realize that you're all doing the same thing to each other. Then it's almost like it sounds like it's more cold-hearted, but it's actually more fuzzy, you know, because you realize that that's actually how you really do interact with people at a real deep level without all the morality gimmicks and all the politics that people just use to try to pull you in one direction or another. Like, oh, it's like the big one we hear, oh, it's safety, safety. You shouldn't do this because it's not safe. That's, that's not really their concern. Their concern is, oh, my God, he's treading on my territory. That's, that's the real reality, right? So once you understand that's what it is, you, you stop uh, getting upset at people not agreeing with you. You also don't disagree with people as much trying to push your own opinion, right? Because you realize, oh, crap, how do I know if I really am right? Like this whole freestyle trampoline thing could be a complete failure, but I'm okay with that because I like the journey. And once you kind of realize that it's just about the journey and playing that game and having fun playing that game, then all the other stuff doesn't really matter. You don't, you don't, you don't fight over stupid crap. You don't get waste. You don't waste your time talk, looking at the news and actually making an opinion because you don't care about the news. You know, you just focus on what you're trying to accomplish in your life. So I would say that would be the biggest thing that I, I use all the time. What's one thing about you people wouldn't expect? Um, I am very calculated. People think I'm a freestyle guy because I wear Hawaiian shirts and I'm always smiling and stuff. But in reality, I'm more of a calculating, analytical researcher kind of guy. The, the, everything they see on social media is blatantly fake. It is what I know that the world wants to see. And I understand that and I'm okay with it. A little stressful at times because I'm always have to be on. But it's, I'm actually like a bookworm <laughs> behind the scenes and just researching stuff and just, you wouldn't expect it, you know? And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not the guy that people see online. I just know that that's the way the world is going. So I've, I've adjusted my image to fit that based on popular demand. But behind it, um, I'm a very uh, introverted kind of guy that just, I just like to think and be philosophical and not get worried about all the traumas of the world. I just want to research and learn. Mm -hmm. The last question, I like to flip the script a little bit. So instead of me asking the question, it's you asking the question, but it's not to me. So pretend you have this crystal ball and you can ask this crystal ball any question, you'll get the 100% honest answer. What is one question you want to know the answer to? 
just one question? <laughs> um, I would say that I would want to know, will everybody eventually speak the same language, have the same currency, and amalgamate into basically a, uh, a fluid thing? We're already seeing a push for that, whether it's actual theoretical or actual real, depending on you know what side of the spectrum you're on from the political side. But I would like to know, are we actually ever going to really amalgamate and actually agree? Or are we always going to be fractionated into our own little communities where we just will always have a non never ending uh, fights and wars about just a new thing of, you know, new topic of the day, but the same fight underneath it. I would like to know that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, Greg, I want to thank you so much for taking the time to be on this podcast. I want to give you the floor. Where can the people find you plug anything and everything you got right now? Yeah, well, since you guys are obviously podcast uh, fans, then check out our podcast. It's The Row Show, Freestyle Sports, uh, Freestyle Action Sports Podcast. Uh, just search up, up, you'll see it. I have a fun cartoon of me and my uh, stuffed uh, mascot, Freestyle Freddy. And um, just Greg Row Trampoline on anything from Pinterest to uh, Twitter to YouTube. Um, and then FreestyleTrampolineAssociation.com. If you want to get involved with anything we're doing, we work with a lot of different kids and brands and projects. And I'm sure that you uh, are tailoring towards a business-minded audience. So uh, anyone who wants to get involved with something, I can send you more info. And uh, maybe we can help these kids out with, uh, with your brand. Awesome. I want to thank you once again for taking time to be on this podcast. And I want to thank everybody for listening. Whether you've listened the entire way through or you only listen to bits and pieces, I really appreciate you taking time to check this out. Everyone, do me a big favor. Go and follow Greg on Instagram, on TikTok. Subscribe to his podcast. I'll make sure everything's linked in the show notes down below. If you'd like to follow me, you can find me on Twitter and Instagram and at the Jacob Kelly. Feel free to come and say hello. My DMs are always open. If you'd like to follow the podcast, you can find us on Instagram and at my social life podcast or YouTube by searching up my social life. As always, this podcast is powered by TrueFan. Thank you once again for listening, everybody. We'll talk soon.